Good evening and welcome to the NCAR Explorer Series. Brought to you by the National Center for Atmospheric Research. With funding support from the National Science Foundation. Your host for tonight, Lorena. With assistance from Dan and Aaliyah. Technical support from Paul and Calvin. Special guests this evening, Christina and Scotty. Now here's your host, Lorena. Hi everybody. I hope you're doing well tonight. Thank you for having us in your homes. Wasn't that such a great intro? Thank you to Dan for making that. My name is Lorena Medina Luna and I am an education and outreach specialist at NCAR. I'm also the lead organizer for these NCAR Explorer series and I'm really excited because this is a long awaited event that we had to postpone in March. So we're really excited to bring you Christina McCluskey and Scotty McLean for their talk, Catcher in the Sky, a tale of modern day science, research, and aviation. Today, we will be using Slido, which allows you to join in the conversation by typing in questions and voting up a question. Also by participating in polls, we'll get some feedback and some interactive abilities with you. If you're just joining us, go ahead and scroll down to the page and you'll see a link for Slido. We currently have a couple of polls in, like, that you can interact with. We're interested to know where you're tuning in from, how many of you are watching. And when you think of the word cloud, what comes to mind or what feelings do you get? So we'll be forming a word cloud with these words. And while um, you guys are doing that, I'll just let you know, again, we are having some technical support with um, our media specialists, uh, Paul Martinez and Kelvin Tavares, taking our questions and polls and helping us with that are Dan Zitlo and Aaliyah McCauley Hartner. And let me just tell you a little bit about NCAR. So for those of you who are joining us for the first time, we are located in Boulder, Colorado, but today we actually all are coming to you from our own homes. NCAR is the National Center for Atmospheric Research, and it is a world leading organization dedicated to the study of the atmosphere, the Earth system, and the sun. Everybody that I've met have been so passionate about the work that they do and have been so great at doing these lectures with us. We have them all archived. So if you like this one and you're interested in a couple of more, you could check out our NCAR Explorer series website and see more videos of lectures short science videos, and even the previews if you missed them for this event. So again, if you haven't already finished the polls, definitely take a moment, let us know what you think about the word cloud, and let us know where you're coming in from. Kind of interested in that. So today, Christina McCluskey um, is one of our speakers. She is a project scientist in the Climate and Global Dynamics Laboratory, which we call CGD at NCAR. And in this capacity, she studies the microscopic interactions between atmospheric particles and clouds. Her research is motivated by a need to better understand clouds, which are one of the most challenging and uncertain aspects of the Earth's climate, the Earth's climate system, actually. Christina uses both observations and numerical modeling tools to study these processes. Dr. McCluskey earned her PhD from Colorado State University in 2017 and came to NCAR as a postdoctoral fellow in the advanced study program. Dr. McCluskey has spent many hours observing clouds and particles from planes, ships, and research stations around the world, which affords her the opportunity to collaborate with scientists around the world. Our second speaker today is Chief Pilot at NCAR, Scotty McLean. He works at the Earth Observing Laboratory, also known as EOL, 
It's part of the Research Aviation Facility, or what we call RAF. A lot of acronyms, I know. McLean has been at NCAR since 2008 after retiring from the United States Air Force. He flies both the Gulfstream 5 and Lockheed Martin C-130 aircrafts. Since joining NCAR, McLean has flown over 30 atmospheric research field projects around the world, enabling scientists from NCAR and many universities to gain a better understanding of our dynamic and ever-changing environment. These project flights have required operations in a variety of challenging conditions, such as convection, icing, turbulence, and low latitude flights. For this event, we're gonna have the following format. We'll let Christina and Scotty give their presentation. They'll show some cool videos, some graphics. And we did ask you all what you think about, um, there's one question about, at what temperature can a pure cloud droplet freeze? So we'll get back to that question during the lecture. At the end of the talk, we'll have an opportunity to get to see some of the questions that you've posted, and we'll let Christina and Scotty answer those. If we aren't able to answer all of your questions, we'll try to see if we can get some responses to send out via email. So if you didn't register through Eventbrite, it is still open, so you can receive our emails that way. So before we hand it off to Christina and Scotty, let's check out on the word cloud and where everyone is tuning in from. So Dan, can you show us what does the word cloud say so far? Wow, the big one that I see is water. And for the word cloud, I think of clouds, yeah. That's good. Storms, vapor, a variety of clouds, puffs of humidity, hmm. romantic, yes, yes. The size, they're fluffy. Sky, of course, they're up in the sky when we look up. Weather and beauty. But they're still coming in. So, yeah, it's pretty crazy. There's a lot to it. And Let's go ahead and see where are people tuning in from? Wow, we have people from Delaware, Oklahoma, Fort Collins, Denver, lots of Boulder, Frederick, Massachusetts, Florida. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty warm out here too. Yeah, we have a lot of locals. So it's, I actually was able to see some of you guys, like some of the names were very familiar. So we appreciate you coming back. Hope that you continue to join us and hopefully sooner than later, we'll be able to have you back in the building. And if you're ever visiting Colorado in the future, definitely stop by NCAR, we'd love to see you. Wow, oh, Washington, New Jersey, New York, and the list goes on and on. This is amazing. I'm so glad we we're getting to see you tonight. Well, virtually, of course. Great. So I'm going to actually hand over the stage to Christina to get us started. So big, warm round welcome to Christina. Woo! Thank you, Lorena. And thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Um, I am very privileged to be here with Scotty, um, and I'm excited for the, the slides that we have to share with you. So the title of our, our talk today is Catcher in the Sky, A Tale of Modern Day Science, Research, and Aviation. And you can probably imagine from this title that there's quite a bit in this. But I'm going to take us back um, about 11 years ago when I did an internship, and I saw an image similar to this one. And the presenter who was showing us this image talked about how you know, beautiful the earth is when you look at it from so far away. And it's quite a humbling photo in a lot of ways. And the presenter also accompanied this photo of earth with a picture of an astronaut's uniform. And this astronaut's uniform looks something similar to this one that I found on the internet. And what, was, um, what he pointed out was that there are many different layers to an astronaut's uniform that protects a human from space. 
and from all the conditions that you would experience in space. And it provides oxygen, it protects you from sunlight. And the point that the presenter was trying to make was that all of these protection that required a lot of engineering and time to, to build is all provided for us for free in this thin, beautiful blue line surrounding our Earth. And it was in this moment that I started to visualize myself um, finding a way to help um, understand the atmosphere, not only just from the point of view of curiosity, but from the point of view of trying to protect and make sure that we are taking care of, of this thin blue line that protects us from so much. And so I wanted to share this story with you um, as sort of a moment for us to share of an appreciation and gratitude. Um, I think that's an important thing to have right now during this time. Um, but I also like to share this because everyone has a different um, place that they're coming from when they enter the field of atmospheric science. And I hope that everyone has um, an opportunity to continue to meet people who've come through NCAR and from other places um, in the field. As Lorena mentioned, I study clouds. So here's another image of our beautiful Earth taken about a month ago from satellite imagery. And you can see all these beautiful white structures surrounding the globe. And these are all clouds that cover various regions of the world. Um, and with them come weather, but also they impact our climate. And so this is a really important feature of our Earth system. Um, and this is what I spend a lot of my time thinking about and studying. I like this diagram here because it provides a little bit of a overview of how we um, tackle the question of the Earth system and how we study it. And so this is showing all these different gears, including laboratory studies, field measurements, and modeling studies. And all of these gears work together to keep moving um, in, a, in a special way. So laboratory studies are used to isolate process level physics and chemistry, um, and then Field measurements allow us to really quantify the truth about nature. Um, these field measurements are absolutely fundamental to understanding processes and their role in, the, in their broader environment. Um, and they really provide a lot of context for us in terms of the processes that we've um, studied in the laboratory. And these two types of experiments and measurements and studies also then feed into modeling studies. And so these are numerical models, which um, we also use at NCAR. And the modeling studies are really useful for many things. Models are used to predict weather, um, but models also can be used to determine how much we understand about the Earth system. So these models have several different equations and ways of representing what we think are the most important processes in the Earth system. So modeling studies are really useful for allowing us to identify um, exactly what we know. And then whenever we find gaps in that understanding, we can then direct the observational laboratory studies. So this is how we approach a lot of our questions is by attacking them from various different perspectives. Today we're gonna to talk about clouds um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of geek out a little bit about some of my favorite things about clouds. And we're also gonna talk about the Southern Ocean, which is a very mysterious place that many people probably haven't spent a lot of time thinking about, but it's a very special place for our Earth system. And then finally, we're gonna talk about our flying laboratory that's here at NCAR. Um, and this is where Scotty is gonna give us his perspective on flying for science, and which just seems to me like the coolest job ever. Okay, so clouds are important for precipitation and for climate. And what I mean by climate is that Clouds reflect sunlight, and you know this based on um, shade that's provided from clouds. And clouds also insulate the surface with terrestrial radiation. So if you think about a summer night that's cloudy, it doesn't get quite as cool as a summer night that is a, is a clear sky. So this is how the clouds actually interact with their energy in the Earth system, and this affects our climate. So it's really important that we understand how clouds are formed. Everyone who's joining us tonight has seen, you know, hundreds of different types of clouds. Um, I have four different types here, and depending on the cloud, you can expect different types of experiences on the ground. Um, for a summer thunderstorm, especially out here in Colorado, I saw someone from Oklahoma. We're all very familiar with these amazing thunderstorms, and what you would do if you saw one of these is grab a rain jacket and maybe not, maybe not go anywhere. Um, you would expect heavy rain, maybe some hail. 
Um, tropical cumulus clouds, you would maybe expect a little bit of drizzle, but mainly you'd be wanting to get photos of these. Um, and then the winter snow forms, we would um, expect beautiful snow. But we also see things that don't precipitate at all. Um, and these are these cirrus clouds high up in the atmosphere that look very wispy, and you wouldn't grab a rain jacket for these, right? You, and these actually don't precipitate at the ground. And so just from these four examples, you can see that there's quite a diversity in the types of clouds that we would experience um, on a given day. A lot of our cloud physics come down to some very fundamental properties of water. And so I was excited to see that water was the most common word in our, our word cloud. Um, these are gas, liquid, and solid. And we are all familiar with these phases of water. Um, hopefully a lot of us have enjoyed at least a little bit of the solid phase this year. Um, we know we're very familiar with rain, the liquid phase, and if anyone's from the south like me, you're very familiar with the gas phase um, and, their, and its humidity. And so a lot of what we do is we try to understand where these different phases exist in the atmosphere. And this is important for water cycles, precipitation, and again, climate. And so water vapor is our gas phase, cloud droplets are our liquid phase or rain particles, and we also have ice crystals in our solid phase. So how are these different phases formed? For cloud droplets, atmospheric particles serve as cloud condensation nuclei. Atmospheric particles come from various different sources. We have smoke, dust, pollution, agriculture, and sea spray aerosol. All of these and, and additional ones will all produce various different types of atmospheric particles. And these particles are required to allow a nucleus for water vapor to condense onto the atmospheric particle and form a cloud droplet. And this process occurs at warm temperatures, um, higher than the freezing temperature. And that is at minus, or excuse me, at zero degrees Celsius, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And these are our liquid clouds, our warm phase clouds. But we know that there are colder temperatures in the atmosphere and that there are clouds at these really cold temperatures. And so what we also need to think about is how do we get these ice crystals? And so the question that we asked at the beginning of this is what temperature can a pure cloud droplet freeze? And so I'm wondering if while I'm showing this next video, Lorena can look up the uh, most common answer to that question. To answer that question though, I'm gonna show a really cool video I took about two months ago, back in February, or wait, I don't know what month it is, a while ago in February, <laughs> where I had a Nalgene bottle that was filled with tap water from my sink. It was left in a car overnight. You can see there's uh, snow on the ground. It was a very cold night. Um, and what you'll see at the beginning of this video is that the, the water in this bottle is liquid. And then all I do is shake it, and you can see all of the water glaciates. And now we have the solid phase. And this process is called ice nucleation. It occurs at these cold temperatures. And you are able to have liquid at these really cold temperatures because water has the ability to be super cooled. And this process happens in clouds as well. So Lorena, I just kind of flashed up the answer, but what was the most common answer? Yeah, so the most common answer 28 people voted zero degrees Celsius or 30 degrees, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, and 23 people voted negative 40 degrees Celsius, 19 people voted negative 10, and seven people voted plus 10 degrees Celsius. So the winner is zero degrees Celsius at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, and that's what I thought when I first started um, learning about clouds. Um, and some of you got this right. So the actual temperature that cl pure cloud droplets can freeze it's minus 40 degrees Celsius. And so that homogeneous freezing, meaning that it's pure liquid water, doesn't occur until these really, really cold temperatures. So we know that ice phase clouds occur at these really cold temperatures, but we know that clouds also exist in between these two, two temperatures. And that's where mixed phase clouds occur. And this is where things get very interesting. We can still have atmospheric particles serve as our cloud condensation nuclei. And we can still maintain those liquid cloud droplets, like I just demonstrated in that bottle. But we also have some of the atmospheric particles that can serve as ice nucleating particles. And these are very special particles. Um, these particles have um, a surface that looks 
or mimics the structure of ice. And this actually favors the ice formation process through the ice nucleation uh, mechanism. And so water can still collect onto these ice nucleating particles. You can still form a droplet, but at some point, depending on the temperature, you can actually have what's called immersion freezing, where the cloud droplet containing one of these ice nucleating particles will form an ice crystal. And there are um, several different mechanisms where ice nucleating particles can form ice crystals in this temperature range. And then once those ice crystals are formed, there's a process called ice multiplication, where these ice crystals actually serve as the most efficient um, ice nucleating particles in a cloud. So once that first ice crystal is formed, then you can have basically a domino effect occur um, in the cloud. But like I said, this is where things get really interesting. The atmospheric particles that I'm just talk I was just talking about are pretty common in the atmosphere. Um, and what I'm gonna demonstrate here is that the ice nucleating particles are very rare. And so for atmospheric particles, if you had 10,000 atmospheric particles, you may have up to one ice nucleating particle. And this is because ice nucleating particles have these special features. And this is a very active area of research um, that is still going on. People have spent quite a lot of time studying ice nucleating particles. This is kind of a busy figure. Um, but the point is to show that a lot of people have worked on this. This is looking at number of ice nucleating particles per liter of air, and this is temperature on the x-axis. So we have higher concentrations at colder temperatures, but the point of this figure is really to demonstrate that we have all these different types of atmospheric particles. We have dust and orange. We have red um, biomass burning. Marine aerosol are shown in the blue. All these different colors represent different types of atmospheric particles, and they have different um, abilities to form these ice crystals and these clouds. This is a very active area of research, like I mentioned. So we um, have now talked about how these different phases can occur in the atmosphere and the clouds. Um, we know that cloud droplets really need these um, particles to serve as cloud condensation nuclei. And we know that ice crystals, especially in the mixed phase cloud, require these uh, ice nucleating particles. The other interesting part of um, cloud physics that really make this first step very important is actually how phase transitions. So ice to clouds, or to cloud droplets, cloud droplets to water vapor, and, and so on and so forth. And this is a very um, interesting area of research as well. And to show just a very beautiful example of these phase transitions, I have these images um, from my colleague at Colorado State University. In the middle, we have the solid phase, the ice crystal, and in the surrounding of surrounding the ice crystal are these cloud droplets. This is the liquid phase. They look like little donuts. And then the, the gray is basically water vapor. So you have some amount of water vapor or humidity that's surrounding both the cloud droplets and the ice crystal. And as I click through, pay attention to the size of the ice crystal and then what happens to the cloud droplets. And what you'll see is that ice crystals grow, and this is by collecting water vapor from its surroundings very quickly. And then the water vapor is replenished by cloud droplets evaporating. And so I'll finger through those again. So you can see that this happens, and it happens very quickly. Um, and this is really important because when you think about a cloud, if you have a liquid phase cloud and that's it, no ice, over time you may expect that those cloud droplets will grow through condensation. If you have a mixed phase cloud where you have some ice crystals, over the same amount of time, those ice crystals will grow at the expense of these cloud droplets. And over the same amount of time, you would have a higher probability of having large ice crystals and maybe even precipitation. And like I said, this happens very quickly. So understanding the cloud phase is very important for the lifetime of the cloud. So how long the cloud stays up in the atmosphere and also whether or not it precipitates. To give you an idea, again, of our current understanding, which is what we use our Earth system numerical models for, I want to demonstrate this by showing um, a study where the fraction of clouds that are liquid are plotted against temperature. Again, I'm going to show this mixed phase temperature range. Um, and this is in Kelvin on this plot, so I've translated that to Celsius and Fahrenheit for us. So now we're looking just at the mixed phase cloud. This is going to be um, I think it's 15 different simulations, different um, numerical models. 
And what you'll see is that each of these different colors represent a different model. And in this temperature range, you can have, depending on the model that you're using, zero to 80% of the clouds being liquid. So this is a huge range and it demonstrates how, how relatively little we know about the system and about clouds um, in this temperature range. And we know that this is really important in terms of climate. So there are many remaining uncertainties in the ongoing study of clouds, in particular mixed phase clouds. Um, but two that I'm gonna focus on today um, is the abundance and properties of these cloud nucleating particles and the cloud phase transition processes. Okay, so the mysterious Southern Ocean is, um, the reason why I say it's mysterious is because this has been um, one of a very interesting part of the globe, but extremely poorly represented in our observations, meaning that we just haven't been able to get down there very much um, to, to make really high quality observations. But we are able to look at them from, the, from satellites. And the Southern Ocean, based on satellites, we know is one of the cloudiest regions on Earth, and it's very important for our climate. And you can see that here in this image where the, the clouds of the Southern Ocean cover most of the ocean. And you can see the contrasting color between the clouds and the ocean color. And this, is, this makes these clouds um, very important in terms of their brightness and how much solar radiation or sunlight they reflect back to space. When we use those observations from satellites to determine a yearly average cloud cover, so how frequently clouds cover a given, a given location, um, that's what's shown here over the, the whole globe. And if we focus on the Southern Ocean, you can see that the cloud cover over the course of a year ranges from 80 to 90%. So this is a very cloudy region. And whenever we use, again, our numerical model um, to, to demonstrate our current level of understanding, we do see that the model is able to reproduce a, a maximum in cloud cover over the Southern Ocean but the order of magnitude of these clouds is too little. And so what we know is that the Southern Ocean clouds in these Earth system numerical models are too few. We also know that they contain too much ice and too little liquid. And that's on, based on studies that I'm not, I don't have time to share today. Um, and this is all based on satellite observations. One of the limitations of satellite, of, of satellite observations is that sometimes if the cloud is very thick uh, or contains a lot of liquid, um, the satellite is unable to penetrate all the way through that cloud. And so what's demonstrated here in this cartoon is that we may be able to get data all the way down to just above the bottom of the cloud, but at the very bottom of the cloud, we may not know exactly what properties um, and what phase and how deep that cloud goes. So a study was done where a ship was compared to the satellite and the ship campaign is shown here. This is south of, of Tasmania. And the ship, is, the ship track is shown in these gray colors and it was compared to the satellite data. And what they found was, if you again look at the fraction of clouds that are liquid in this mixed phase temperature range, we found, or they found that depending on if you're looking at the ship observations or the satellite observations, you could see 25 to 50% of the clouds that are liquid. And this difference is even bigger at these warmer clouds. So it's really important for us to get observations within these clouds, which is where our flying laboratory comes in. The other component of the Southern Ocean, we talked about atmospheric particles and, and how they're important for cloud formation. And this is a great animation from NASA showing dust, sea spray aerosol in blue, smoke and, and green, and pollution and white. And these are all these different atmospheric particles getting evicted or transported across the globe. And you can see that um, there's quite a diverse uh, population of atmospheric particles depending on where you are. In the Northern Hemisphere, we see a lot more pollution and dust simply because we have more people and more land in the Northern Hemisphere. In the Southern Ocean where we're talking right now, you can see there's a lot more blue. And this is because sea spray aerosol is the dominant local source here. And there's occasionally some dust or biomass burning and maybe sometimes pollution that enters the Southern Ocean. But for the most part, the Southern Ocean is one of the most pristine regions on Earth. But we also know that we have extremely limited number of observations of these special ice nucleating particles. 
And a lot of what we understand about the Southern Ocean is again from satellite observations. And so this is a, that figure again showing the different ice nucleating particles from different aerosol, um, or excuse me, different atmospheric particle types. And the thing to point out is that depending on the type of atmospheric particle, you are going to have different um, abilities of nucleating ice. And so this really demonstrates um, the importance of really knowing exactly what atmospheric particles are there and the importance of defining the ice nucleating particle population. So here we have dust concentrations, um, or excuse me, dust ice nucleating particles are way higher than the marine ice nucleating particles. And we expect, based on what I just showed you, that the Southern Ocean probably has more marine than dust. So some of our research questions, um, based on the fact that models struggle to simulate clouds in this region, is do these models accurately represent atmospheric particles and ice nucleating particles in the Southern Ocean? And are our current observations from satellite really able to accurately describe cloud properties? And this is what motivated the Socrates campaign, the Southern Ocean Clouds Radiation Aerosol Transport Experimental Study is the name of that acronym. Um, and this is really motivated by the need of these microscale observations of Southern Ocean clouds and atmospheric particles. And so I'm going to stop there. Um, and then Scotty is going to talk about our flying, uh -oh, our flying laboratory. And um, let me, oh, there we go. And sorry. And Scotty's going to talk about our flying laboratory and what all goes into um, planning and, and achieving these research goals. OK, thanks, Christina. Um, and thank everybody, all you folks for uh, joining us tonight. Hopefully uh, you'll enjoy this uh, and have uh, a lot of questions for us. But again, my name is Scotty McLean. I'm the Chief of Flight Operations at the Research Aviation Facility, which is part of the Earth Observing Laboratory, which is part of NCAR. So just to give you a little background about it, what it is that we do, airplanes are expensive. We have two very expensive aircraft that are very specialized. And all the, a, a bunch of these, well, none of the colleges and universities in the United States can afford to operate these aircraft and outfit them like we can. So back in the 50s, um, NCAR basically started up and we've been providing atmospheric research platforms for the university system across the United States and even some of the uh, uh, international folks as well. So once, um, once Christina and her scientists have identified the uh, objectives of what it is that they want to do, then we'll start working together oftentimes 24 months to uh, 18 months out before we ever fly for the first time. What we'll do is we'll work with them and we'll translate what it is that they're trying to do into language that pilots understand and the aviation community like the air traffic control understands as well. But before we go into that, we operate two aircraft. First, the one on the left is a C-130. It's an ex-Navy aircraft. Um, it flies at 200 nautical miles per hour, and we can go about 2,500 nautical miles with the plane. Uh, again, research speed is 200, uh, 200 nautical miles an hour, and it can reach 27,000 feet. This platform, the C-130, is the preferred platform for um, chemistry projects. It's large in the back, and it can hold many instruments. We sort of consider this thing a, a Mack truck. The Gulfstream 5 on the right, this is our newest aircraft. Um, it flies at 460 nautical miles per hour true, which is about 80% of the speed of sound at altitude. So that's Mach 0 .80. And we'll, uh, it's not uncommon for us to reach 600 nautical miles per hour with a tailwind. We can travel 3,500 to 5,000 nautical miles depending on the wing loading. When we put pods on the airplane, that uh, causes our fuel burns to increase. And we can reach 51,000 feet if we have a light payload and not much gas. Otherwise, the targeted uh, research altitude for high altitudes, 41,000 to about uh, 49,000 feet. I wanted to take this uh, opportunity, I think it's about 90 seconds or so, just to show you what it is that we do once we have got all the permissions from ATC and the aircraft is loaded up and we have science folks on the back. This is a project that we did out of Guam this is gonna be about, uh, I think it was about 3,000 nautical miles. We're gonna reach altitudes of 47,000 feet. We're gonna profile all the way down to 500 feet uh, over the ocean here. This is in the Gulf Stream 5. 
We have wing pods uh, with a camera mounted on the outside, and I think it's taking about a frame a second or so. And then our data systems folks, once we get back, they'll put these together. So this is us going down to 500 feet. We'll stay there for about five minutes. And what they're doing is sam sampling the marine boundary layer at this point. That's truck lagoon that just passed off to the uh, right hand side. Now we're starting our climb up to 49,000 feet. And the instrumentation on the aircraft is, is uh, gathering data the entire time. That's one of the reasons when Christina was talking about in the Southern Ocean that they use observational airplanes and we do these profiles so they'll be able to, to sample the air uh, all the way uh, up and down. You can see as we get higher that the uh, sky gets blacker. It's one of the nice things about the Gulf Stream. It can, we do fly high enough to be able to see that. Now we're coming back in toward Guam. And the air, aircraft is gonna configure for landing. I think I was flying this plane, so I know the landing was smooth. So this was a seven hour research flight. This condensed into down to about 90 seconds. So when somebody mentions flight operations, what comes to your mind? I bet it's something like this or this. And I gotta admit, that's the best part because it is fun to fly. Taking off and landing is the absolute best. But in reality, we have to do an awful lot of preparation. We have to do a lot of study and we have check rides, tests, simulators. Um, we're always in the books. We spend a lot of time researching international airspace. We spend a lot of time um, coordinating with air traffic control. And uh, I would estimate that for every flight hour we fly, we probably spend five hours of preparation on the ground before that. Our aircraft, this is in the C-130. We can't, we're limited to a thousand feet over land just because we're turbine powered and we're over 12,500 pounds. So when the scientists would like us to profile down below a thousand feet over land, we have, we have to find um, air, airports to do little approaches to. So we'll come in and we'll configure, and we'll fly these little approaches down, I don't know, sometimes to 100 feet, some, sometimes to 50 feet, and then we'll, then we'll do a go around. This is actually up at Greeley. This is a couple of years ago. We were doing a pollution study up and down the front range for that. Not only does this get the scientists what they need, but it also gets us an instrument approach that we can mock as well. So I wanted to take just a minute to show you the uh, air, traffic and flow, air traffic flow over the world. All these yellow dots represent an airplane. All these airplanes are taking off from somewhere and they're landing somewhere. They're carrying people. They're going from point A to point B. New York to Los Angeles, Atlanta to Chicago. They're all, they're all on a mission. They're all traveling with folks. Now here we come. This was a thunderstorm study that we did several years ago uh, across the Midwest of the United States. We're actually flying with a NASA aircraft here. You can see these tracks. The red track is for uh, 817 November Alpha. The green track is what we flew. You can see we're not going from point A to point B. All we're doing is making spaghetti. So I wanted to show this slide here because this shows exactly what it is that we do. We, we have a balancing act. We know that Christina has a limited amount of flight hours to get what she needs, but yet we can't just completely shut down air traffic flow over certain areas. So we'll take her objectives again and we'll translate those into something for air traffic control and then we'll start briefing the air traffic control folks. We've traveled all over the United States to the major centers when we want to drop radio signs through uh, at high altitude through airways and we've um, uh, travel to Dallas to uh, brief holding patterns in the middle right in the D, uh, DFW traffic pattern. But unfortunately, air traffic control has a different view of what it is that we think we're doing. And I've never heard them say, well, it's for science, so go ahead and do whatever it is you want to do. That doesn't work. So we do spend a lot of time talking to the air traffic control folks. 12 to 24 months prior to our first takeoff, we'll start getting ready. We'll start working with the scientists. We'll start developing flight plans. But when we're doing that, we're also looking at bed down locations for the aircraft. We carry a 
lot of uh, logistical supplies with us. The instruments need a fair amount of uh, care and feeding when we're on the road for uh, six to eight weeks. We have to take a look at the aircraft performance to make sure that we can safely take off uh, with a full load of gas and with a uh, full load of instruments on board. We have to also identify the risks. And once we identify the risk associated with the project, we have to come up with some kind of mitigation uh, factors as well. And then finally, once again, we take a look at the airspace and we do a complete analysis of that. As far as the logistics goes, we have to worry about not only runway, but uh, parking weight bearing capacity too. The C-130 weighs 155,000 pounds when it's fully loaded and the Gulfstream is at 90,900 pounds for taxi out. So we have to make sure that the ramp area and the runway can take our weight. So we certainly don't want to destroy somebody's runway by taking off and landing on it for six weeks at a time. That could get quite expensive for us to pay for. We also have to make sure that we have enough runway length to take off with. Um, once an aircraft is fully loaded and it's hot outside, uh, that can take a lot of runway. So we'll do all kind of worst case uh, scenarios with different temperatures to make sure that we, we are able to take off on the runway. We also have to make sure, especially when we're flying overseas, that they'll be able to have enough fuel for us to fuel up. C-130 will pump 58,000 pounds of fuel on board, the G-5 about 41,000 pounds. So if we go into smaller areas, that may completely overwhelm their fueling system with that. Um, an additional factor that we have to have in the winter times with the scientific instruments, we cannot de-ice. I'm sure all of you pulled into uh, commercial airports before when you boarded an airplane in the winter and you, you taxi through the de-ice line. We can't do that because that'll contaminate the instruments. So when we're doing a winter project, we have to have a hangar, a heated hangar, so that we can uh, not worry about frost and uh, snow or ice on the wings. Aircraft performance is a big issue for us. Um, as we, duration means we need gas. Once we, we can only weigh so much to take off uh, an airplane with, so we have to depend on the payload. That may cause us to put less fuel on. Less fuel means less time. We also have to always make sure that we take off and we lose an engine and then we'll be able to fly with, on that, with that engine being out. If there's an obstacle out front, we plan to lose an engine and then we fly out on the single engine until we clear that obstacle and then we can come back around and land unless we have to burn fuel down. So when we, did, when we take off, we're always going down the runway. We have a decision speed, we call that uh, V1. We're going down the runway and in our minds, when we're rolling down the runway, gathering speed and takeoff speed is usually about 120 knots or something like that. We're going aboard, aboard, aboard. And then once we hit to a certain speed, then we transition to go, go, go at that point. So, we always plan for the worst case, and that means we have to be able to fly over obstacles with engine losses. Again, with aircraft performance, these pods that you see on the wings, most aircraft don't have them. These, pod call, these pods cause drag. Drag means that we have to have an increased power, um, increased power to be able to fly at normal speeds up there. And that also means less duration because we're burning more fuel. We identify any kind of hazard that we have. We do a complete analysis for that. And oh, by the way, this is not our aircraft. This is just a stock plane that I uh, cut off the uh, internet here. But convection, we'll do studies around convection. For Christina's project in the Southern Ocean, we were actually studying ice down there. So we were targeting ice in there. With convection comes turbulence. Turbulence can also be caused quite severe turbulence when the jet stream, particularly in the winter, when we're flying into or out of the edge of the jet stream, Wind shear is definitely a hazard uh, for takeoff and landing. If the winds shift on us, that can cause uh, issues for the aircraft. Air traffic control, while well, they're not really a risk, but we, for safety, they are a risk for mission accomplishment. Again, we spend a lot of time talk, talking to the air traffic control folks. Flying low level, we'll go down to 100 feet over the water in both aircraft and over land 1,000 feet, but then we'll do a lot of low approaches to get below the 1,000 feet. We've actually done 30 low approaches before on a research mission uh, just to gather the data over the land from the science folks. Mountainous terrain, it's pretty obvious if we're flying low level through mountainous terrain, we have to worry about engine loss there, towers, power lines, and all that kind of stuff. So we have to do a complete uh, terrain analysis before we'll do any low level operations in the, in the mountains. Extreme temperatures, particularly with high altitude runways, like, like our home base at Rocky Mountain Metro, when it gets hot, the pressure altitude goes up. That means the thrust is not as effective as it is in, on cooler days. 
So we have to be worried or we have to be cognizant of the temperature. And if it gets to a certain point, we have to download fuel uh, as well. And then finally, fatigue. That plays a big part in some of our projects, particularly the night projects when we're flying out, out of our window of circadian rhythm. So we'll have to mitigate that by giving us extra sleep time, by giving us time to adjust to that. And then we also monitor fatigue quite uh, closely on these projects. We're asking people to, to report fatigue. And if somebody's uh, too tired to fly, then we'll just have to take a day off and, uh, and rest for it. We also do a, an airspace analysis, particularly around the busy areas. If you can see all these, all these green lines, they're airways. They'll normally have a lot of air traffic on it. These red squares here with my cursor, that's all military airspace. So we have to coordinate with the military to either be allowed into that military airspace or we have to fly around it um, and not through it. So all that can, can cause delays. It can cause us to have to fly hundreds of miles out of our way in order to get around something like that. Um, and it's just something that we have to be always looking at. International clearances is, is a big deal for us. We travel, since we're government aircraft, we travel in our dip diplomatic clearance process. So we'll travel to countries and we'll brief them a year out to make sure that we'll be allowed to do what it is that we want to do. We have a big project coming up out of Okinawa next year, and that's gonna be flying in Japanese airspace, some US airspace, and um, the Philippines airspace, and Vietnamese airspace. So we're planning on traveling over there this fall to start the, or the discussions with air traffic control um, at that point. So that's it in a nutshell, what we as flight operations do and how we work with Christina. What I'd like to do is pause here and let uh, Christina take back over here. Thank you, Scotty. Um, let me make sure I'm getting back to the right spot. So as Scotty mentioned, we are planning things like Socrates many, uh, many, many months in advance. Um, we are gonna talk today about the Socrates campaign, which occurred um, south of Australia. We were based out of Hobart. We completed 15 research flights um, that are mapped out here. These are different flight tracks. Um, and we didn't have a lot of issues with air traffic control in the middle of the Southern Ocean. So our flights are actually um, are quite nicely compact over the same uh, region. And one of the things that we planned for this campaign was um, the, the type of air, the type of flight path we would have um, to sample these clouds. And so we would, we proposed to start out by flying south um, on what's called a ferry leg. And then once we would descend down to our most southern latitude, on our way back to Hobart, we would then sample the clouds through various maneuvers. So we would be in cloud, getting properties of the clouds. And then we would also um, evaluate the atmospheric particles below the clouds and above the clouds. And we would repeat these maneuvers all the way back to Hobart. We also plan to rendezvous with um, ship-based measurements. This is a ship that was based out of Australia, the RV investigator. And there's also a, a whole bunch of ground-based measurements that are made at the Macquarie Island site. What would actually happen um, is, <laughs> We would adapt um, because like anything you can plan for best case scenarios but you oftentimes have to adapt your plans for the research needs for the, whatever the weather is giving you um, for the next week or so and so we a lot of times our flight plans actually look like this where they're sketched out on a hotel notepad we still would do our ferry leg south we would have our above cloud leg our in cloud leg and our below cloud legs to get really good property, get really good statistics on the different atmospheric particles in the clouds. And then these sawtooth profiles um, where we were going in and out of the clouds. Um, and then we would repeat this all the way back to Hobart until Scotty or the pilot would tell us that we were um, needing to go back home. The instrument payload for Socrates is, um, I think, an interesting thing to just show. This is the G5 aircraft and all the different pods that Scotty had some great photos of. Um, and these are all a whole bunch of acronyms, but we measured atmospheric particles and ice nucleating particles from different inlets. We also measured um, the properties of the clouds, so liquid water mass that's in the cloud, and also the number and mass of cloud droplets and ice crystals. 
And we also have images of these cloud droplets and ice crystals. This is a cross section of the G5 cabin. And so this is similar to what you would see on the United um, web page where you would go select your seats, except you would have six options and you actually can't choose because um, there's clear places where you have to be. Um, there's always six seats um, during the Socrates campaign where people could actually sit during the flights. We had several different instruments, the ice nucleating particles, which was my um, primary instrument that I operated that uh, belongs to Colorado State University. We also had cloud remote sensing measurements and we had measurements in atmospheric particles and also the cloud particles. I just wanted to mention that um, on top of the, the, you know, up to two years, sometimes longer of planning that goes into planning these field campaigns, we also spent quite a bit of time here in Boulder play, uh, preparing the plane um, through our installation process. And this can take five to six weeks, and this is a pretty um, intense process to get the G5 ready to go into the field. And this is an image inside of the G5 from the scientist's point of view. This is me here on one of our final research flights as part of Socrates. And I thought I would point out that the G5 crew manifest um, for the G5 is, is quite small um, when we have research um, flights with the G5 versus the C-130. Um, we have our two pilots, a technician who is making sure that we are following all of the things that we need to follow and make sure that we're staying safe, but also supporting us whenever we need help. Um, we have a, more, a mission coordinator who is actually coordinating with the pilots to make sure that our flight path um, and our desires from back here in the cabin from the scientist's point of view are possible or can be compromised. Um, and then we have a mission scientist who is responsible for uh, making sure that we are staying on task with our research objectives and also is in conversation with the coordinator and the pilots whenever changes have to be made to the plan. And we have instrument operators. Most instrument operators um, in any flight campaign I've been a part of operate anywhere from two to five instruments at a time. Um, this is a pretty intense process, but it is so much fun. Um, being part of this very um, special group is quite, quite an honor. Um, and then I just wanted to mention, you know, we're all wearing headsets and we're all in conversations as well. And one of the big things that makes us different from a normal airplane is that we are actually part of the crew. So in case of an emergency, we are all trained and responsible to take action and to um, be part of the solution. And so that's a really um, special role to be playing in these, in these missions. So measuring ice nucleating particles from the G5 was done with the continuous flow diffusion chamber, which is an instrument from Colorado State University. And an image of that uh, instrument is here. Um, and I don't, I think we're running out of time, so I'm not going to explain in detail how this instrument works, but I will say that the instrument is similar to a cloud chamber and that it simulates the conditions for a mixed phase cloud. And what we're able to do with that is take advantage of the different phases and those phase transitions and actually identify the number concentrations of these ice crystals um, and then the ice nucleating particles that forms them. So this is an instrument that we use to quantify numbers of ice nucleating particles in the atmosphere. We also have measurements of clouds. Um, this is another image inside of the G5 of a scientist operating several instruments. Um, we have ways of imaging. These are different cloud droplets that are imaged throughout a flight. And here are images of ice crystals also from this um, pod here, the FIPS. So combining all these different instruments, we're able to really quantify and characterize the clouds and the atmospheric particles um, while we're flying. And the main objectives for my current research are to characterize the abundance of ice nucleating particles and the phase of the clouds over the Southern Ocean, and also to evaluate and improve clouds in the Earth system numerical models. And this is a flight and a video of a flight over the Southern Ocean, and it just shows how beautifully cloudy this region is. So one of the main takeaways from this study is that concentrations of ice nucleating particles are extremely low over the Southern Ocean. So this is now again showing ice nucleating particle number concentrations at different temperatures. And I don't expect you to necessarily have an idea of what these numbers would mean. But basically, over the Southern Ocean, at minus 20 degrees Celsius, we have less than 0.1 ice nucleating particles per liter of air. So in a liter of air, you have less than one ice nucleating particle. 
And if you contrast this to the continental US, you may actually see one to 100 isonucleotide particles at that same temperature. And so this is a really important contrast that I kind of hinted to earlier, where the Southern Ocean is so depleted of these isonucleotide particles, there's just not a lot of sources of them there. And this is a really important feature of the Southern Ocean clouds. And so what we do is we learn about these in different environments, and what we can do is take it back to our Earth system numerical models. And so this is sort of a cartoon, but also um, somewhat real life where the climate models um, do kind of feel like a black box filled with a bunch of code. Um, but there is actually um, a reason for the different code that's in there. Um, the Earth system numerical models, like I said, serve as a tool for us to um, kind of apply our best state of the art knowledge um, to trying to model the Earth system. And so we're using this now as a starting point in trying to improve that, uh, that numerical model based on what we've learned from Socrates. And so taking us back to the beginning of this talk, I showed this diagram of the different phases of water and all the phase transitions. This is pro these processes are also represented in our model. And this is showing this very busy <laughs> schematic, but it includes all the different processes that are actually being simulated in these models. Um, we have our cloud ice, cloud droplets, water vapor, rain, snow, hail, grapple. Um, this is just one example of, a, of what's called a scheme that represents all the processes going on in clouds. And we are constantly trying to improve this and develop it into a better model. Recently, we've made changes to how the model represents these ice nucleating particles. Specifically, the old model used to basically say that if you're over the Southern Ocean or if you're over the continental US, it doesn't matter. You have the same number of ice nucleating particles. The new model now has a better way of representing the fact that the Southern Ocean has fewer ice nucleating particles than the continental US. And this was motivated based on studies that have shown, like we have at Socrates, that the Southern Ocean has very few of these ice nucleating particles. And so what this is showing is the simulated Southern Ocean mixed phase clouds. And again, I'm showing fraction of clouds. Here I have liquid in blue and ice in this um, yellow color. And this is our old um, way of representing ice nuclear particles. So where Southern Ocean and the continental US are equivalent. And you can see that liquid phase is only um, dominating above about minus five or minus eight degrees Celsius. And our new way of representing this, where we actually demonstrate, where we actually represent the fact that Southern Ocean has fewer ice nucleating particles than the continental US, then we see that our liquid, our liquid clouds over the Southern Ocean um, are more common um, at down to colder temperatures. And we also have less ice in the model. So this is an improvement in, in terms of containing more liquid in the simulated clouds. So the new model physics allow for these Southern Ocean clouds to maintain the liquid water cloud droplets longer. So this is our old scheme where we have ice crystals and over time you would ex um, they are precipitating or the clouds are dissipating. And the new scheme we have far fewer ice crystals and the liquid clouds are able to, to sustain for much longer. And now what we're working on with the data from Socrates is we're doing direct comparisons of our model clouds and our observed clouds. And this is really the truth from the observations. This is what we need to truly evaluate the model because what I've shown so far are just comparisons of different simulations, but we don't really know what is that truth. And so this is showing the measurements from the Socrates campaign. We see that liquid clouds dominate all the way to about minus 20 degrees Celsius, and then ice clouds quickly dominate at the colder temperatures. And when we compare this to our new model, we see that in fact, we now have too much liquid in our modeled clouds when we compare them to our Socrates um, observations. And so what this is telling us is that additional improvements are still needed to the model. And now we're working with looking at the actual phase transitions and making sure that we're really getting these ice nucleating particles properly represented in the model. And so I'm gonna leave off with this scheme again where again, we're reiterating this process where all three of these components, I've mainly talked about field measurements and modeling studies today, but the, um, sorry, I keep getting something coming up. But the, the point is that all of these things work together 
in efforts to better understand our Earth system, in this case, clouds. Um, and we are constantly um, evolving our knowledge um, because of the efforts that are being put in in all these different components of, um, of study. And so I'm gonna stop sharing because I, I think that I probably showed enough science for everybody today. And I'm going to pass it over to Scotty so he can show all of his awesome um, photos that he has taken over his uh, many years of flying for NCAR. Okay, yeah, I've got some really neat pictures that have been taken uh, all over the world. So uh, this is just pure enjoyment here. But remember when I talked about night flying? This is coming back in at, uh, uh, at a uh, base in Virginia. This is about five o'clock in the morning after flying for almost uh, eight hours. The top picture, I was in the left seat for this one. This was also the Guam project. That was taken at 49,000 feet. We came overhead. And one of our scientists just happened to be on the beach and looked up and he had a big uh, telephoto zoom uh, lens on, so he snapped that picture. This one is a G5 taking off out of Rocky Mountain Metro. You can still see the snow on the ground for this one. I think that was a evening takeoff. We also fly formation with our sister research organizations, a NASA P3 uh, joined up on our wing for this one and uh, came up and we do this for uh, compares, comparing instruments. With the airflow over the wings and the fuselage with all these instruments on there, we have to calibrate them to make sure that they're accurately reading. So whenever we fly multi-aircraft project, we'll also always take uh, the opportunity to fly close together. So then we can figure out if the, if the instruments are are an agreement or, or not. In a perfect world, they'll agree 100%, but many times we'll have to uh, develop some algorithm or something to correct once they figure out which aircraft uh, is wrong. Remember what I said about night flying? These are more night flying shots here. These are sunrise shots taken about 400 miles off the coast of New York for a winter project. This is the Gulf Stream um, flying uh, for sunrise uh, coming back from a Chile at our, uh, a uh, research project out of Chile. C-130 picture to the left is a C-130 cockpit. This is another sunrise shot. The picture on the right, this is over Atlanta, Georgia at 500 feet. Uh, we actually coordinated with air traffic control at three o'clock in the morning. There's not much traffic and they allowed us to come down and fly it, uh, perpendicular to the runways at, uh, at 500 feet over Parksville. Uh, so that was one of the really cool shots. I'm from Georgia. I, it was sort of uh, exciting to me to get to fly over right in the middle of Atlanta, right over the airfield uh, that low. The bottom picture is a C-130 coming back uh, for landing after a local research mission. Again, that's a wintertime mission. This G-5 uh, picture at the top, this was taken on a project called Orcas. We flew that out of southern Chile, and this is off the coast of Antarctica. You can see the icebergs down here. Uh, we were actually, we rendezvoused with a ship like Christina was talking about, except this is off, this is down between Chile and Antarctica. And we were descending down to 100 feet at that point in the Gulf Stream 5. We'll slow to 200 knots for that. Uh, we don't want to be doing 250 knots when we're flying 100 feet over the water. But a person in the research ship, he was up in the mast, um, and he just happened to have his camera with him, so he, he shot that picture. C-130 is coming back in uh, for landing on a Tennessee uh, project that we flew out of Smyrna, Tennessee. Uh, that was a pollution study there all over the uh, Ohio River Valley flying, low, low altitude gathering, uh, and, and out in Texas gathering information for, the, for that. This is off the coast of Antarctica. This is a research ship that we are rendezvousing with here. I don't remember the name of it. But we absolutely love flying in that area because, well, number one, there's no air traffic control and it's totally uncontrolled and you can do whatever you want to do with it, but it's just absolutely breathtaking. So this bottom picture is off the ice shelf for this Orcas project. We were flying down and we were actually trying to stay over the, the ice shelf. You can see where it's melting there, but gorgeous. I mean, it's just spectacular. It's uh, some of the prettiest area I've ever flown over in my life. This is a C-130 taking off at Rocky Mountain Metro. And we were, uh, this was a long range telephoto lens that took this and we were about to, to go through the gap that you see straight ahead there and drop down and fly low level to the uh, west, west side of the mountains. This is one of my favorite shots. We flew this uh, CSET project and we were taking off out of um, Sacramento, California. We were flying low level all the way to Hawaii and recovering in, in Kona. 
And then the next day we'd take off and reverse this. We'd never get above 10,000 feet. Uh, we were actually studying these clouds that has the rain that have the rain showers coming out of them. And uh, we flew by this and one of the scientists took this picture. So we flew the eclipse in uh, 2019. That was over in uh, uh, Island of Pasca, Easter Island's airspace. And we uh, had to do extensive coordination with ATC for that. Because the eclipse is not like if you miss it, you get another chance. You don't. So we had to be on time within a second of the first point. And then we were flying the track of the eclipse and we were letting the sun come by and catch us. Uh, the uh, scientists that were studying that, um, they, can only, they can only take the information that they want to take during an eclipse and they were studying the coronal mass at that point. So we talked with Chile, this is oceanic airspace, there's no radar. We do have data link on the aircraft, so we're talking with them. They allowed us to hold. We got to the first point an hour early, um, and it was seven hours out there, so we wanted to make sure we had plenty of time, and we actually entered a holding pattern, and then we kicked out of the holding pattern when it was time to head down track. This is a high-speed video of what the eclipse looked like uh, out in the middle of the ocean. We really do get to do some cool stuff. We flew a study, um, we flew two of them actually. One was out of Florida, one was out of uh, home station, Rocky Mountain Metro. And we're studying these sprites. It's energy bursts that come out of the top of big thunderstorms. Um, so we'd be flying in the middle of the night, another night project. This is actually sort of what the view looks like out of the cockpit until you see the lightning. But anyway, um, we would fly 50 kilometers off the thunder, or off these big massive thunderstorms in the east, around the uh, Midwest. And we had high speed cameras on board and they would capture these things called sprites shooting straight up from the, uh, from the thunderstorm. You can't see these with the naked eye. Whoops, back up. That's what they look like. That's the, that's the black and white image with it. I think that was taken through a uh, pair of night vision, a night vision site. Here's what they look like in color. Again, you can't see these with the naked eye, but uh, it's amazing what scientists are uncovering out there that can't be seen. And that concludes the uh, a little over an hour's worth of scientific research for tonight. So again, thank you so much for tuning in to us and I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Scotty and Christina. You guys do amazing work. You get to travel so much. You have so many instruments and models that use these observations and you like play it back and forth. Thank you everybody for joining. I know it's almost 8.15. We're gonna take a couple of questions, but if you need to head out, no worries. Um, I'll be sending out a survey via the Eventbrite email. But let's go ahead and see what is a question that we've gotten. Dan, can you post up one of the upvoted questions? And I'll read it out loud. And then Christina, I think this one's for you. So it says, Dr. Christina, what is more important in your studies? Results from observations or computer models? Uh, this is a great question. Thank you, Paul. Um, I think it's probably pretty obvious based on how I had my gear set up that observations are definitely my preference. I think it's important to quantify truth first. Um, our numerical models are very, very good tools that are pretty necessary, but I think that they are, um, I think we definitely need observations to understand what the natural world is. There's still so much that we don't know. And a lot of times observations reveal things that, you know, maybe we hadn't thought about. So I think observations would be um, more important um, if, if I had to choose. But as you can tell, I kind of like it all. Great. And we did have a question for Scotty. And the question for Scotty is, Scotty, are you ever denied access to airspace? And does it change the experiments or observations that are being conducted? As a matter of fact, yes, we have. Uh, Venezuela wouldn't let us in their airspace when we were studying a uh, tropical storm 
uh, study back in 2010, I believe. And yes, yeah, sometimes uh, it just depends on air traffic control. If you put our, if you put yourself in the controller's perspective, uh, they're really not getting anything out of it. Uh, but they are, they do a marvelous job working with us. And uh, we always talk with the scientists before a field project. And we understand that we will take some delays. We will take some holding patterns or something like that that may not allow them to get as much information they want to do on a particular flight. But uh, we have enough flights where that's usually not a problem. Sometimes though, with really restricted airspace, we will, and there's weather that they can target away from that. Once we've had a couple of uh, delays or something in a row, then we'll try to stay away from that particular spot that we're uh, experiencing delays. Yeah, there's a lot of air traffic control back and forth communication that you do. So it's intense. And Dan, can we see the, what's the next question that has been uploaded? And I think this might be for Christina. It asks, what role do clouds play in global warming? either positively or negatively? Uh, this is a, also a great question that we are currently working on answering. Um, a lot of our work is motivated by the fact that we don't have a very confident answer on that. Um, depending on the type of cloud, where the cloud is located, um, what the cloud is made of, whether it's liquid or ice, and how those clouds would respond to changes in um, particles in the atmosphere and how particles would change in a changing climbing climate. This all impacts how clouds would impact um, the global climate. And so this is why this research is, is so important is because a lot of what we're trying to do is get the best fundamental understanding of clouds so that then we can answer that question. But that is kind of the million dollar question right now. Maybe billion. Wow, that's, that's a lot of money for a question of science. <laughs> um, let's go ahead and see a question that they've had for Scotty. The question asks, Scotty, it looks like a lot of in-cloud icing in the Southern Ocean, super cold water. How do you handle in-flight clear or severe icing? Well, first of all, severe icing means that our uh, onboard de-icing systems, anti-icing systems uh, can't keep the ice off the aircraft, so we certainly don't want to go there. We will, for uh, other icing conditions, we'll have our uh, weather officer on board, which we call the mission coordinator, and we have scientific instruments that can tell them immediately when we get into super cool liquid water, clear icing, or severe icing at that point. So we'll always have an escape plan in place. For the Southern Ocean flying, we did get into uh, super cool liquid water uh, a couple of times. As soon as we did, we were able to climb out of it just a thousand feet or so. Those clouds were actually pretty thin. But as a rule, no, we don't want to fly in that. We don't. We definitely do not want to uh, stay in that environment too much longer. But the bottom line is that's one of the risks that we identified early on, and we came up with mitigating factors to prevent that and to allow us to safely operate the airplane. That's so great. I'm glad that you guys just think of safety first and not just, let's just go for it. Definitely important. Um, let's take another question. Dan, which one should we take? So there's a question and I'll just leave it for maybe Christina. Have there been any, have there been any studies to seed clouds to move between different properties of clouds of gas, liquid and solid, for example, to make it rain in drought areas? Yes, this is actually uh, cloud seeding is one of the beginning points of a lot of what we understand now about ice nucleation and um, the different cloud phases that I was, I was talking about. A lot of that ages back many decades ago when, when a lot of experiments like that were conducted. And this has also been um, recently become more a, a more active field, including a scientist at NCAR. Um, and there was a um, there was a campaign, I think it was called Snowy, 
um, that was conducted um, in Idaho, I think. <laughs> but um, I was obviously not involved. Um, but this is definitely an area of research. Um, and it, it not only is interesting from a point of view of water resources, but also the physics behind what's happening when you when you see a cloud and what the downfall downstream effects are of doing that process. Um, there's a lot of physics that can be learned um, through those experiments. And so that is definitely an area of active research right now. Yeah, that definitely has been an interesting hot topic. Dan, can you post up the next question? And just to let you guys know, again, we might not be able to answer all the questions, but definitely just doing our best to um, push through and see what we can answer for now. So Scotty, this might be a question for you since you kind of brought it up. Um, where can I find information about the upcoming study that will take place in Okinawa? I think you can simply Google NCAR and uh, EOL, NCAR EOL ACLIP, A-C-C-L-I-P, and that should come up at that point. Yeah, and that's going to be an exciting um, presentation, or not the presentation, but a research, which hopefully we can have a presentation about. Um, it was postponed from this year to next year, which is going to be amazing. It's Correct. And you're going to get to fly it again? Hopefully. <laughs> awesome. So, um, Dan, would you be able to post up maybe one or two more questions? This question might be for Christina. At what threshold will ice crystals form snow? That's actually a really hard question to answer. Um, let me see if I can do that quickly. It really depends on um, the, I think snow versus ice crystals. There's a, there's a not a very clear difference. A lot of people will use size, um, but I, if you're thinking in terms of snow falling, a lot of that depends on the actual um, winds, like the vertical winds that are lifting the cloud up, and that determines whether or not a particle in the atmosphere will be able to fall. And so there's a, it's kind of difficult to answer that question without knowing exactly what you mean by snow, but <laughs> technically there are some size thresholds that people use to define snow. Um, but if you're thinking about snow hitting the ground, a lot of that depends on some of the other environmental factors. I hope I answered that question okay. Wow, and like you said, it is an active research question, like this whole clouds and stuff. So if anybody wants to be a scientist that studies clouds or cloud nucleation, snow, there is an opportunity for you. And Dan, let's go ahead and see what is another question that we've gotten. Ooh, Scotty, which area of the earth that you flew in had the most fascinating clouds? Well, let me think. That's uh, that could be a tough one. I actually think that the um, the best clouds we've ever flown around have been in the Midwest. They're also they can also be the most intimidating. Obviously, we've done some thunderstorm studies around there, um, and they are quite challenging, but they're very beautiful as well. So you know, a fifty thousand foot, sixty thousand foot thunderstorm, and we're trying to fly around it so they can take their measurements from them. It's it's quite interesting. So. Uh, definitely the United States, but actually the clouds down in the Southern Oceans are quite nice too. They're, they're, they're very benign and they're not very thick, but they're really cool, especially when we're pro, go, go Christine, I saw that. So especially when they, when we can profile through it and then break out and you've got this just beautiful pristine water down there as well, so. That's awesome. And of course we have to say the Southern Ocean is also one of the best places. There's no other, there's not that much airplane traffic, so you get to see as far as the eye lets you. That's right, yeah. And um, just to close out this session, I actually wanted to ask Christina first and then Scotty, 
Can you tell us a couple of words, if anybody is listening out there who is interested in doing this type of work, but they're kind of like shy about it or they don't know like what, what kind of advice could you give them? Um, that's a great question. Thank you for, for asking that. Um, and I hope some people are listening who have opportunities in the future to be involved with this. Um, I would say my most common piece of advice for people who are interested but not really sure what they want to do and maybe don't know exactly how to find out is to ask questions. And so as soon as you meet somebody who's in the field or is somehow related to the field, I think it's really important to basically interview them and ask them, you know, not, not formally, but, but ask them questions about how they got to where they are. Do they like their job? What do they like about their job? Um, and so on and so forth. And remember, if you're shy, that the easiest way to start a conversation is to ask somebody about themselves. And usually, especially if they're very proud of where they are, they'll be very happy to share any information that they want. <laughs> and so, because they're proud of where they are. And, and I think that it's really easy to have a conversation if you simply ask somebody about their career and about their track. So I think that's the biggest piece of advice. That's how I got to where I am. It's just asking questions, so. And Scotty, do you have any words of wisdom or kind of something you'd like to share? Sure. As, as far as if, you, if anybody out there has a love of aviation and you've always wanted to sort of get in it, what I would recommend is make that a definite goal for you and then work toward it. It takes a long time uh, once you get your pilot's license to start building hours. I went through the military route, but uh, there's also the civilian route out there. Study hard, make good grades, and start flying as soon as you can and just stick with it. Um, it's, it's very, very, very rewarding. Um, I've been flying since 1982 now, 83 now. So I love my job. I'm very, very fortunate. There's four pilots here. I'm very fortunate to have retired from the military and I'm fortunate enough to have found this job. So absolutely fantastic. So if you love aviation, make up your mind, do what needs to be done, stick with it. That's so great. Thank you both, Christina and Scotty. I'm going to rewatch this lecture just because I'm sure there's something that I missed. And for all of you out there, we do also have a daytime um, Ask NCAR series on Wednesdays through the UCAR virtual program. And just go on our website, check out the different videos that we have, and we hope to see you next time. We'll let you all know when and what is next time. So. Goodbye for now. Hopefully you got to howl at the moon. And thank you, Christina, Scotty, and everybody for joining us today.